Pints with Jack, Season 4, Episode 83. After Hours with Catherine Langrish. Welcome, everyone. Pints with Jack is your weekly C.S. Lewis podcast where Matt, Andrew, and I break down and discuss the works of C.S. Lewis. This season, we've eavesdropped on the Screwtip Letters and listened to his toast. And we then began Narnia Month by reading The Silver Chair, and we're spending the rest of this month interviewing different guests on different Narnia-related subjects. And today, we're joined by Catherine Langrish. Catherine Langrish is a British author of fantasy for children and young adults. She was brought up in Yorkshire and Herefordshire. Her grandmother, Leonora Thornber, was a Yorkshire novelist and playwright in the 1930s. Catherine also wants to be a writer from a young age, and to that end, she gained a first-class honours in English from the University of London. The university also awarded her the Sir Charles Harris Prize for the best results achieved. She went on to study medieval literature at University College and King's College London. She worked for six years in the information office at Lloyd's Register London, before moving first to France and then to the United States, where she became involved in oral storytelling to school children. Upon returning to England in 1999, she began writing the children's fantasy novel Troll Fell, which was published by HarperCollins to critical acclaim. She blogs at Seven Miles of Steel Thistles, try and say that three times quickly, and is married with two daughters and currently lives in Oxfordshire. And today she's here to talk to us about her book, which was released in April, which is entitled From Spare Oom to Wardrobe, Travels in Narnia with My Nine-Year-Old Self. Catherine, welcome to Pints with Jack. Thank you. It's lovely to be here. Now, first off, congratulations on the book and particularly for its Narnia first edition style front cover. Um, as well as a truly delightful and creative title, From Spare Oom to Wardrobe. Uh, it's funny, Lewis, with the titles of lots of his books, or at least his first attempts, are usually pretty terrible. And I find with a lot of uh, Lewis-related authors, they, they keep their, their illusions fairly limited, and I just love this title. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, I had to think of something that was a bit headline-grabbing, I suppose. And, and because it's a journey through Narnia, I know... From spare oom to wardrobe is probably not very far, but it just seemed to me to sort of sum up the magic and sort of playfulness of the books as well. Absolutely. My wife and I have just bought a house and we will have several spare ooms and I'm absolutely getting spare oom signs for each of them. (laughs) Wonderful. Now, my curiosity was aroused when I first received your book when I read the subtitle, Travels in Narnia with My Nine-Year-Old Self. And I think it grabbed me because... I was introduced to Narnia at a very young age, even younger than you. I think I was only a couple of years old, and I fell madly in love with it. And after about the age of nine, I don't think I touched them again until I was in my mid-twenties. So like you, I got to journey back through Narnia as an adult with my childhood self. And we'll get to your story shortly, but while I was reading your book, I I regularly thought of the Latin proverb, quid quid recepitur ad modem recipientis recepitur which literally translated means that whatever is received is received according to the, the manner of the receiver. Or if we were to put it into Narnian language from The Magician's Nephew, what you see and hear depends a good deal on where you're standing. It depends on what sort of person you are. Mm. And I found it really interesting to read about how you received Narnia as an adult differently from that of a child. Some things were different, some things are unchanged. And it was definitely the same for me when I, when I think back through rereading Narnia for the first time as an adult. And I just found the entire idea really fascinating to think about how our age, our education, our experience, our worldview, what even what other books we've read, the, all of these things contribute to how we receive a story. Yeah, I mean, I think reading is, it's kind of performative communication between two minds, the reader and the writer. And I think in a way, we're always learning to read, at least it doesn't stop with simple competence, does it? Um, you know, each new book is a new introduction to someone or some ideas or some thoughts. And as we grow up, obviously, most of us become much more critical, more demanding readers. We learn to, you know, vet the text, query the writer's motives, uh, make conscious comparisons with other, other texts. And that's fine. And that's the grown up way to read. But the way children read is equally valuable, I think. Um, you know, children just immerse themselves in the story. Um, They they believe in what they read and they inhabit the world of the story in an almost physical way. And that's why I think good books for children are so important, because a book you loved when you were a child is going to stay with you for the rest of your life. 
And the Narnia books are a wonderful example of that. That's definitely true. I, I think I know the geography of Narnia as well, if not perhaps better than the village in which I grew up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not surprised. Well, I'd like to get back to Narnia as soon as possible, so let's move swiftly through our standard episode segments. And since this book is about reading the Chronicles as a child and returning to them as an adult, for the quote of the week, I chose a section from Lewis's essay on the three ways of writing for children, where he wrote, When I was 10, I read fairy tales in secret and would have been ashamed if I'd been found doing so. Now that I am 50, I read them openly. When I became a man, I put away childish things including the fear of childishness and the desire to be very grown up. Mm -hmm. For the drink of the week, it's early here on the West Coast of the United States, so I'm having a very large coffee. Uh, Catherine, are you drinking anything? I'm having a very mild beer um, and a little one because it's not that late here either. <laughs> it's five o'clock somewhere. Well, cheers. Cheers. Well, we should actually do a proper toast because here at Pints for Jack, we toast our new upper tier supporters. And today I'd like to offer a toast to a delightful chap whom Matt and I recently spoke to, Shane, who is the founder of a chain of bookstores, Gotwall's Books. So, Shane, son of Adam, from the far land of Spare Oom, where eternal summer reigns around the bright city of Wardrobe, may you often return to the books of your youth and never get too old to read fairy tales. Cheers. Cheers. So, as mentioned earlier, the subtitle of your book is Travels in Narnia with My Nine-Year-Old Self. Would you mind telling us a little bit about your childhood and how you found your way into Narnia in the first place? Well, um, I had a very happy childhood with two big brothers. No, one big brother, one little brother and an older sister. Um, and I was an insatiable reader from a very young age. In fact, I, I can't remember learning to read. I can remember learning to write, but I can't remember learning to read. And I used to sit on the floor with my teddy bears and my dolls and read them stories. Um, Beatrix Potter, I seem to recall. The Tale of Mr. Todd was my favourite, which is a good dark story. Uh, I liked that. Um, my older sister drew a cartoon of the family once, which I've still got somewhere, and it shows various members of the family doing their, you know, characteristic things. And there's a picture of me, aged about three, running around the house with a book with the caption, read me this bookie. <laughs> so that was definitely um, part of uh, growing up for me. We had a lot of books in the house. Um, and I read a lot of the classics and hand-me-downs from my big brother and sister. So yes, I mean, Beatrix Potter, Enid Blyton was a huge thing mm. when I was growing up. And I think my mother was fine with me reading them, but keen to get me on to other stuff. And it was she who bought me the silver chair as a Christmas present when I would have been eight, in fact, the Christmas I was eight. And um, I really didn't like the look of it at all. It was the penguin, or the, rather the puffin edition, paperback edition, with the wonderful Pauline Baines illustrations. And this one, of course, shows the underland with lots of little gnomes. And the gnomes frightened me. Um, I had read an absolutely dreadful story in my school reading book which is in fact um, a fairy tale collected by Joseph Jacobs. It was collected in Canada, even though it's in English fairy tales, and it's called the Hobbyers. And the Hobbyers are terrifying little gnomes who persecute a farmer and his wife and their faithful dog. And the story ends with the farmer and his wife being carried off in a sack by the Hobbyers and the faithful dog having all his legs cut off. And this was the most horrendous story to read. And it, it, it really, really put me off. And when I came to read The Hobbit, which sounded very much like Hobbia, I was most suspicious. I didn't like Gollum. He sounded like a Hobbia to me. And looking at the picture on the front of the silver chair, I thought, goblins, I don't like the look of this. So I put off reading it um, until Christmas was nearly over. And I'd read all my other books. And as there was nothing left, I started on the silver chair. I don't think my mother had realised that it was um, not a standalone book. And of course, it can be read as a standalone, really. And I was absolutely swept away. I was enchanted. There was, I think Christmas was a wonderful time to read it because it was cold outside. We actually did have snow in Yorkshire in the 1960s. And um, it was the most wonderful winter journey and the most wonderful fairy tale I'd ever read. And from that point on, I was absolutely converted. I, I went on to read all of them in completely random order um, over the next couple of years. And they became a huge part of my life. And in your book, you describe what you did when you reached the end of the Chronicles and realised that there were no more books. 
Can you please tell everyone, what did you do? Ah, yes. Well, and I I knew there weren't going to be any more books either because C.S. Lewis had unfortunately died a year or two previously. I was so desperate to read something more about Narnia that I decided I had better write my own stories. So um, I filled an old exercise book that was lying around the house with stories I called Tales of Narnia. And I illustrated these. I drew maps. They were all copied from Pauline Baines, of course, but I put a lot of effort into them. And um, I wrote about, I think, eight or nine stories in this book, all based on characters who are incidental but are mentioned in the Tales of Narnia. So the first one was about King Gale, who either it's in Prince Caspian or it might be in The Last Battle, we are told, uh, won the Lone Islands for Narnia by killing a dragon there. So I wrote an extraordinarily derivative story about King Gale taking ship to the Lone Islands to slay the dragon and drew a picture based pretty much on Eustace's transformation into a dragon in the, the, the Voyage of the Dawn Treader. Um, and I had a lot of fun writing these stories, but I realised it wasn't the same as reading them. And of course, I also realised, um, to my mild surprise, I think that I wasn't as good a writer as C.S. Lewis, <laughs> particularly aged nine. Um, and it wasn't it wasn't really the same. You couldn't be in the story the same way. Um, I knew I was making it, not not just going there. But it got me writing, and um, I had an enormous amount of fun. And some of that story is reproduced within the leaves of your recent book. And as I was reading through it and looking at it, I realized a few things. Firstly, that your handwriting as a nine-year-old was better than mine has ever been. Uh, I-, I loved the way that you used the same elevated speech for the Narnian royalty. Uh, because that was one thing I struggled over when I was a kid, when in the sections of the horse and his boy, and at the end of the line, the witch in the wardrobe, when they're speaking in a far more elevated English, I couldn't understand why they were speaking so funny. Uh, mm-hmm. But the other thing that I realized is I had never written any Narnia sequels myself. And, and that was the first time I realized that. And I found that kind of shocking. I don't know why I never did that. It was probably because I was a terrible writer and not not that uh, not quite that level of creative, at least at that point. Uh, but it is absolutely adorable. And I would recommend anybody, when you pick up Catherine's book, read, read the inside leaves so you get a sense of what she was like as a nine-year-old. Thank you. Well, yeah, I think the handwriting is probably better than my current handwriting as well. So I think my handwriting has definitely deteriorated. And because Narnia was so important, I was writing very, very carefully and trying to keep my spelling right, although it wasn't always perfect. <laughs> yes, the, um, the elevated language, well... Wasn't that hard to remember? I think it consists mainly of a few tags like with a good will, sire, and, uh, <laughs> and that sort of thing. But in fact, I, I was reading such a lot. Um, I'd come across pretty much the same sort of thing elsewhere in old fairy tales or, or stories. I think I, Blackie's children's classics was a thing. Um, they were cut down versions of classic stories like Robinson Crusoe with I suppose a lot of the boring bits cut out. <laughs> and I had a number of those. They were the sorts of things that your parents would buy, for, well, my parents would buy for me when we stopped to f- refuel on the motorway or something. Um, and they were, you know, you'd get Walter Scott, for example. I mean, it's bizarre to think of it now. Nobody would think of of doing even a cut down version of, of Walter Scott for children, but there it was. Um, and one of the things I think I read was Robert Louis Stevenson's The Black Arrow, which is... Um, a romping yarn set in the civil wars in England. And he deliberately filled it with what he later called tushery, which is lots of people going, gadzooks, sire, by my face, and that sort of thing. And, you know, I just sort of romped through it, really. So um, I, I sort of got got the hang of that. Also, of course, um, and I only thought about this recently, when I was a child and we went to church, we still had the... 16th century book of common prayer and we all the bible readings were from the king james bible so hearing that sort of language wasn't unusual and we sort of picked it up i think if we went to church at all and indeed um every school that i went to had a bible reading in the morning and that wasn't you know that was state schools they weren't particularly religious schools it was just a thing that was done Hmm. it's not done anymore um but um at least i don't think so so I, d- I don't think the, the language 
proved such a problem. I think it was something that was around and I was sort of used to. It's wonderful. I'm probably older than you. <laughs> a, a, a little bit. I also have uh, ancestry in Yorkshire. Uh, I too went to primary school in England. Uh, yeah, so it was a little bit later, but there were a few things that you mentioned in your book that, that brought back some memories. I'm glad. So that was how you came to visit Narnia. What was it that prompted you to return to Narnia again as an adult? Well, most of the children's books that I loved as a child, I still own. Um, I'm sitting in a in a room surrounded by bookcases, and this is my children's and young adult book area. And I have a lot of those books still. And I've still got the um, most of the original copies that I had when I was a child, although certainly The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe is falling apart. <laughs> and when my own two daughters were children, I read the Narnia stories to them and they enjoyed them, but they weren't swept away. Um, fashions change and Harry Potter was on the ascendant and they loved that <laughs> and that was fine. They had their own, you know, fav favourite books. And that's 20 years ago. Um, and I realised that I hadn't reread the Narnia books since. And I just began to wonder what it would be like to go back and see whether or not... I, I had such vivid memories of how I felt about them when I was a child. I just wondered if it would be the same. And also, um, I have a blog called Seven Miles of Steel Thistles, um, which is all concerned with fairy tales, folklore, fantasy and children's literature. And that ticked a lot of boxes. The Narnia books tick a lot of boxes there. And I thought I would begin to read them and, and blog post about them. And so I began that. And, um, and that, was, that was how it all started, really. Um, although the book itself took longer and, and was a different um, project, I think, um, or became a different project. Now, when I read Narnia as a child, my favourite was The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. And then when I returned to it in my 20s, that was dethroned and replaced by what was previously my least favourite, which was The Horse and His Boy. Did you have a similar kind of shift in your favourite as you re-encountered the books? No, actually, no. Um, my two favourites, and I've never been able to decide which comes top, um, are The Silver Chair, which I, was the first one I read, and The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, which was the last one I read. I don't think that's got anything to do with it, but I just still love those books. I think maybe The Silver Chair has the edge, but only just. I wasn't too keen on The Horse and His Boy. Um, when I went back to it, I found more to it than I remembered. Um, the other book that I found had more about it than I remembered was Prince Caspian. And I'd not really taken to that book as a child. I mean, I did read it and reread it and reread it because the Pevensies and Narnia <laughs> and Aslan and so on. But the the lengthy parenthesis in the middle, which is all about Caspian's own childhood, I found I didn't want to be learning about Caspian when I was nine. I didn't wasn't that interested. I was interested in the Pevensies. Mm. And also Caspian seemed to be younger than me then. I mean, he still is. Uh, considerably younger than me now, but when I was nine or so, Caspian seemed to be a bit of a baby. Of course, he grows up in the course of the book. And it's such a long digression. I think it's about 60 pages before you get back to the ruins of Care Paravel and find out what's going to happen next. That, that always sort of put me off a little bit. I think I enjoyed it when I was reading it, but I always sort of held back from it a little and thought, well, you know, there are others I prefer. I would say that when I speak to people about Narnia, Prince Caspian is usually people's least favourite. And for similar sorts of reasons, they find that flashback, while it's kind of clever the way L Lewis catches you up, it, it doesn't grab you in the same way as his other books. Yeah, I think it structurally doesn't really quite work. Now, what about more broadly? What were some of the things which retained their magic for you as an adult and what fell flat and also, what could you now appreciate that you couldn't really before? Woo, well, um, I don't think I can say that anything actually fell flat. For example, in The Magician's Nephew, the rather slapstick episode in which the elephant and the other animals are spraying Uncle Andrew with mud. <laughs> Some children may have enjoyed that, but I really never liked slapstick, <laughs> didn't like clowns, didn't like clowning. I was quite a serious child, rather a romantic, serious child. And the, the first and second jokes left me flat then, and they still leave me flat now, I have to say. 
One thing I think at the beginning of the Voyage of the Dawn Treader, I now feel considerably more sympathy for Eustace, even in his obnoxious early stage, than I did when I was a child, because Lewis directs us to dislike him. And I now wonder a little bit about that. Um, two things have struck me, and I don't think I even put this in the book because things keep popping up that the books are so rich, frankly, that there are always new things to think about and, and new ideas. Um, if you think about it, there's Edmund and Lucy staying with their cousin Eustace, and there's two of them and there's one of him, which means in children's terms, they're a gang and he's an outsider. <laughs> and they don't like him. And they make it very clear they don't like him. Poor Eustace, knowing that his cousins dislike him, not knowing how to get on with them, hanging around outside the door making smart Alec remarks and being absolutely crushed. They don't behave very nicely to him. I think he says something, he invents some limerick about some kids who made rhyme, some kids who played games about Narnia got gradually barmier and barmier. And Lucy says, barmier doesn't rhyme, which is a very child sort of way of, of scoring back. And then Edmund says, oh no, Eustace says, it's an assonance. And Edmund says, don't ask him what an assy thing of is. He's only longing to be asked. Say nothing and perhaps he'll go away. <laughs> this is not very nice. Um, and it struck me that we all, we all feel that we know that Diggory and the magician's nephew is, in inverted commas, Lewis's childhood self. But it struck me suddenly that maybe Eustace is Lewis's childhood self. This may not be a new idea to some, but it was a new idea to me. Because he didn't get on at school. He didn't enjoy his school. He was a very, very smart boy. He would have known probably what assonance was when he was Eustace's age. It's possible that he tried to be smart with older boys and got put down. And then, of course, there's the whole conversion thing as the, you know, as he gets turned into the dragon. So he's on this journey that, that Jack Lewis went on. In the end, of course, he's treated sympathetically, but at the beginning, we're absolutely directed to dislike him. And as a child, you do what the author tells you. You believe what the author says, and you don't look any further. So I found that I had a lot more sympathy for Eustace, um, even when he's being silly and horrid um, now than, than I did then, for certain. I think I would agree with that, coming back to it as an adult. I think you get at least a little bit of a sense as a child that he's he's kind of lonely, uh, and I completely agree that Eustace is Lewis. Uh, I'll often say there once was a boy named Clive Staples Lewis, and he almost deserved it. Yes. <laughs> yes. Good point. I mean, that is a name um, which he obviously escaped early. <laughs> and, and also Eustace was an avid journal keeper. And that was another thing that Lewis did both yeah. as a child and even older in his life with All My Road Before Me. Uh, and one of the things that he writes about in a few places that his conversion gave him was the opportunity to stop looking at himself so much yeah. and mm. to look out to others. Mm. Yeah, I think that's that's a good point. Yeah. Now, I saw Neil Gaiman endorsed your book. How did that come about? I actually read his Norse mythology book simply because I knew that Lewis loved North myths and this was a new book that had come out. And after I enjoyed that, I picked up and actually just finished uh, The Ocean at the End of the Lane, which was it was like a modern fantasies is how I'm explaining it to people. Uh, so how, how did you get that endorsement? We have a couple of friends in common, but that wasn't how it came about. Um, or it may be, I suppose. But to be frank, um, he follows me on Twitter. Um, <laughs> oh, life dreams. Which, which is kind of a bit, you know, a bit odd because he's got umpteen million followers and only follows about 900. Well, no, I think he follows about... 9,000. Anyway, anyway, one day I spotted that Neil Gaiman was following me on Twitter. And after all, I blog about fairy tales and folklore and fantasy. So he must at some point have decided that, you know, I was a good person to follow, which is lovely. So I took my courage in both hands and DM'd him. And uh, by this point, the book um, was, we got, you know, it was, it was in publication. We knew what the jacket looked like. Um, it was up on Darton Longman and Todd's um, website. And uh, along with a wonderful quote from Francis Spufford, the best book ever about why we love Narnia, which was I was so grateful for. And um, so I basically messaged Neil Gaiman and said, Dear Neil, I've got this book coming out about Narnia. This is the link. Would you be interested in seeing a copy? 
and didn't expect to hear very much. And to my astonishment, I got an instantaneous response. He must have clicked on the link and then he came back and said, if Francis Bufford likes it, I can't wait to read it. <laughs> and I just about fell off my stool. <laughs> so um, what a nice guy, basically. And everybody I know who knows him says he's a lovely, lovely man. And I'm, I'm certainly a big fan. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks to that last book I read, there was at least one night when I didn't get much sleep. <laughs> In your book, you basically move through each of the Narnian Chronicles and talk through the story and then offer some commentary about how your nine-year-old self and your adult self responded to the different elements. And many people like myself are diehard publication order zealots. <laughs> and in your book, you go through them in chronological order. Was there a particular reason for that? Uh, and particularly since that you didn't read them in either chronological or publication order? Mm. Does it, does it to... actually even matter? Well, I, to be honest, I don't think it matters a shred. Well, certainly it doesn't matter a shred in what order you read them. Um, I'm the living proof of that. As I say, I started with The Silver Chair and ended with The Voyage of the Dawn Treader and read the rest. I can't quite remember in what order, but in random order, whatever I managed to borrow from the library or, or was given for birthday or Christmas presents. Um, but when it came to writing a book about them, obviously I had to think about that. Putting them in chronological order of the internal history of Narnia makes narrative sense. Um, I wasn't writing about C.S. Lewis per se him, as himself. I wasn't writing about his own writing journey mm -hmm. and how he developed as a writer through these books, although I think he did. I think his writing does improve um, as you move through from the books he began earlier and the books he finished later. Mm -hmm. I was writing about the stories and I was writing about their impact on me uh, as a child and as an adult. And according to Walter Hooper, the chronological internal history of Narnia is C.S. Lewis's own preferred order in which to read them. At least that's what he said once when he was asked by Walter <laughs> Hooper and had to come up with something. Um, so I just thought I'll go with that. You have to choose some order. And in the end, it kind of makes sense to start with the creation and end with revelation, don't you think? Yeah, no, I, I, would, I would agree. I, when I flipped open the book and saw the order, I first of all raised an eyebrow and then I read ah. it and I, I, could, I could see what you were doing. I think it yeah. does make more sense for what you were doing because you're writing about Narnia. You know, it's yes. not, not a child, uh, uh, not either Lewis's creation of it uh, or in my case, the order in which I actually encountered those books. Yes, I, I think that's true. Yes. Now, one of the things that I really enjoyed about your book was that you very often pointed out from where Lewis was drawing his imagery. And at a very simplistic reading, people would say, oh, it's Christianity. But it's not. It's also from fairy tales, ballads, myths, medieval romances, legends, Renaissance poetry. Uh, mm -hmm. Could you just give a few examples of where Lewis is drawing on some of these sources? Sure. Well, um, for example, in The Magician's Nephew, uh, Lewis's described description of the paradisal garden on the holy mountain um, where the, the tree of life is to be found, from which Diggory is to pick an apple to save Narnia, and of course, little does he know it, to save his own mother in the end. He's actually borrowed pretty much wholesale from Paradise Lost, Milton's Paradise Lost, when Satan arrives and ignoring the gates, rather like the, um, the Queen Jadis, uh, leaps over the, the wall of Eden to perch in the tree of knowledge. And I can actually... Shall I read the bit? Go for it. It's... Uh, Satan sees paradise, and Milton calls it an enclosure green, crowning the head of a steep wilderness, which is overgrown with forest trees. And then the poem goes, Yet higher than their tops, the verdurous wall of paradise upsprung, and higher than that wall, a circling row of goodliest trees, loaden with fairest fruit, blossoms and fruits at once of golden hue appeared with gay enamelled colours mixed. One gate there only was, and that looked east. And you can just see that is that, is that mountain, that is, the, um, that is the Garden of Eden of, of Narnia and the paradise to which they return at the end of the last battle. But, uh, I mean, the echoes are uncountable, really. There's Edmund Spencer's Fairy Queen, there's George MacDonald, there's Grimm's Fairy Tales, there's John Bunyan, um, John Bunyan's Par um, Pilgrim's Progress comes into its own through the last, the last chapter or two of The Last Battle. Again, you can almost 
see where he's making the parallels between um, Christiana, actually, um, arriving, crossing the river and, and, and arriving at the, um, the celestial city and the way the characters cross, cross the river. I mean, they go up the waterfall and then arrive at the, um, at the gates of um, paradise. So I think I somewhere say in the book that reading through them and detecting all these images and almost direct quotations, but a lot of it's imagery, it's in its way, it's as complex as T.S. Eliot's poem, The Wasteland. You can enjoy it without understanding or recognising them, but it's the fact that they're there that makes it so rich. And I think one of the great things about Narnia is that Lewis put, he just threw into it everything that he loved, absolutely everything. It didn't matter if it was supposedly suitable for children or not, in it went. And this wonderful sort of stirring the pot and, you know, producing this amazing world. I know Tolkien didn't like it because he thought that fantasy worlds should be consistent, but it's the, um, it's the mix of, of mythology and legend and everything that Lewis adored that just gets put, put in there. And it's all mixed up with love and it works. It works wonderfully. And for me, that was one of the big things that jumped out at me as an adult, as I came back to read the Narnian Chronicles with adult eyes, having read a lot more books, knowing my Bible an awful lot better. I started noticing all of the illusions that just went over my head as a kid. I just enjoyed the story. Yeah. And we go through one of the Chronicles of Narnia each season on the show, and we just finished recording the episodes on the silver chair. And we had my co-host, Andrew, his wife, she came on to speak to the biblical allusions, and Andrew was focusing on the literary allusions. And they both had an awful lot to say in that episode, because I'm every sure. book, as you say, is just laden with imagery that has been shoplifted from other works. Mm. And, and I don't think, I mean, he wrote them very quickly. He was doing a lot of other stuff. When you think that all seven chronicles were written between well, certainly published anyway, between 1950 and 1955, at the same time that he was compiling the encyclopedic English literature in the 16th century um, for Oxford University Press and tutoring and doing all sorts of other stuff. I don't think that he may well have been aware of some of the stuff he was putting in. He, he couldn't not have been. But I also think that some of it was just there and bubbled up. Mm. Um, it's, it, it came from who he was and what he loved. And that's how it came out, I think, quite naturally, really. It's not, it's not forced in any way. And that transitions us to a, a very important question I kind of wanted to ask you, because in your book, when you're speaking about Prince Caspian, you pointed to a possible literary source for the chess piece, which the children find in the ruins of Care Paravel. Uh, before I actually get to my main question, would you mind sharing with the listeners uh, what you think that might be? Okay, well... Um, in the 13th century Icelandic prose Edda, which was compiled by Snorri Sturluson, um, there's a tale called The Deluding of Gilfi. Now, Gilfi is a Danish king who goes on a journey to Asgard, to the seat of the gods, the Norse gods, and asks questions of three mysterious figures called High One, Justice High, and Third, which may oddly be influenced by Christianity because Iceland was a Christian country by that point, asks these questions about how the universe began and what the end of the world will be. And they answer him and they basically tell him a lot of what we now know of as the, the Norse mythology. So it's not, even though they may be based, the, the, the triad or the trinity of people whom he's speaking to may have been influenced by Christian um, thoughts about the Trinity, but the, these are not Christian gods. They are definitely old gods who are telling him stuff about the old gods. And so um, towards the end of this quite long story, they tell him that after the day of Ragnarok, uh, when the gods are killed in battle, a new world will rise from the waters, fresh and green, and the sons of the old gods will find in the grass the golden chessmen that the Isia used to play with. And that's just such a lovely um, image, I think, of something being left over from a previous age and a reminder of a previous age 
And I've always found it very poignant. And as a matter of fact, that's one of the few um, references that I did spot when I was a child because I was reading retold, retellings of the Norse stories. Mm-hmm. Um, Roger Lancelin Green did them and a, and a, a writer called Barbara Leonie Picard. And um, I knew these quite well. So when I saw that chessman, I thought, oh, that's just like in the Norse myths. <laughs> um, and I'm pretty sure that Lewis intended that and, and did it deliberately. I think it's just one of those lovely little things that he put in. Well, here we go. So earlier you talked about things bubbling up and whether things were consciously or unconsciously done. As an adult, when I think of that chess piece, I think of what Dr. Michael Ward says about it in his book Planet Narnia, where he points to it being martial imagery, that there's a particular reason that it is both a knight rather than any other piece, and that it has a red ruby eye. And so I don't recall seeing any mention of his theory in your book. Have you, have you read it? Do you understand to what he's arguing? And do you agree with it? Yes, I, I've read it. And uh, Michael's been um, a very good friend to me in the writing of this book. I thought I would not go there um, because A, Michael's done it so splendidly himself. And B, it's not really had any, um, what's the word? I, it doesn't affect what I thought of the books as a child. And in a way, it doesn't really affect what I think of the books now because I didn't read his book anyway until after I'd done most of the thinking for my book. So. <laughs> somebody else's thoughts weren't really applicable. And that was one one thing I decided to do pretty much the whole way through. So it was all, let's look at the primary sources, most of which I know because um, I've been reading folklore and fairy tales and medieval and Renaissance literature for years and years and years. So I wasn't main, on the main, in the main, I wasn't going to have to look any of this stuff up. So it was pretty much written as a very personal account. And I thought if I started to take into account Um, other people's ideas, then I'll just get sidetracked forever. So I left it out (laughs) deliberately. I think for your second part of the question, I think it's, it's a very, very interesting book. It's very well argued. It's extremely learned. I'm almost convinced my main, the main thing that holds me back is that I honestly don't see Lewis as that sort of writer. I just don't think he wrote that way. I don't think he was the sort of writer who puts or would put sort of hidden esoteric puzzles into into his work for people to discover later. I, I It doesn't feel in character. And that's the only reason that I can't really go along with it. I just don't feel it's Lewis. I mm. could well be wrong. You know, I could well be wrong. Well, I am more convinced. But I think the wonderful thing is that if even if somebody isn't convinced by the Planet Narnia thesis... It just speaks to how great Lewis is. Again, as you mentioned, things just bubble up. He read all of this literature, and if it wasn't a a conscious planning out of, of the Narniad to draw on each of these images, you see them flowing out of him anyway. Mm. Oh, yes. And I mean, it could be true. It could be true. And, you know, I, I know Michael's put a lot of this into his book, but of course, you know, he wrote, um, oh, what's it called? Uh that wonderful book about um, the discarded image, universe. the discarded image. Yes. Um, and before that, indeed, um, long before that, he, he, he was writing poetry, wasn't he, about um, the planets and their um, Lady Luna in Light Canoe. I think it starts. One of them does. And uh, about the, um, the characteristics of the medieval planets and all that Neoplatonic stuff as well. So it, it could be. It could be. But I'm not quite convinced. That's okay. But it's very interesting. <laughs> One of the things I always say whenever I speak to anyone who isn't quite convinced, I say, if nothing else, what Dr. Ward did is he brought a lot of people who had read Narnia, he directed them to read the rest of Lewis's corpus. And either way, that's a good thing. Yes, yes, yes. Philip Pullman, he's been quite a vocal critic of the Chronicles of Narnia, and you mentioned him a few times in your book. So in broad strokes, what are some areas where you agree with him and where do you disagree with him? Yes, I, I've... I hope I'm not being unfair to to Philip Pullman. Um, quite a lot of the opinions of his, which I quote, were published a long time ago. And one of the problems with the internet, of course, is that you can change your mind. I don't know whether he has changed his mind or not. He may have. Um, I haven't asked and, you know, I, I have no information on that. But um, some of his criticisms went right back to, oh, uh, 1998, which is a long time ago. 
So it's not perhaps entirely fair of me to have um, to have used him in this way. But on the other hand, I've made it fairly clear that I, he is one of the most prominent critics of, or he's one of the figureheads of the uh, of the criticisms levelled at the Narnia books, and they're generally um, the three pronged trident of sexism, racism, and Christian propaganda. I really don't agree on the sexism front, because as I say in the book, I was a little girl reading Narnia in an age where you could tell that most authors expected, if they thought about a reader, they thought about a male reader, including little boys. Mm. So in a way, as a little girl reading, and I think friends of mine from that era have said they did the same thing. If we were reading a book in which there was a girl who was a bit soppy and not very good, and there was a boy who was adventurous and strong, we just we just identified with the boy yep. and we would read as though we were boys. If there was a slur about girls like, oh, you know, quite a lot of it was, you're almost as good as a boy. Girls got praised. You're almost <laughs> as good as a boy. And we were supposed to, you know, appreciate this. I think not. <laughs> but, you know, so you, you just kind of did this sidestep where you thought to yourself, well, this isn't, a, this isn't, this isn't anything to do with me. I'm, I'm better than a boy or I'm as good as a boy. And I'm, you know, this is, so you identified with the boys, but, you didn't have to um, do that with the Narnia books because the girls are so strong, all of them. Um, mm. It's great that he's got girls and boys in the books, but actually the girls are more interesting. Lucy, for example, is a great example of a good character um, who isn't boring. She's got some minor faults, actually. She can be a bit testy at times. She she can lose her temper. And Prince Caspian, she stamps her foot and... And, and throws her weight about a little bit. Um, in The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, she's very nearly tempted by the spell to make her that speaketh it beautiful beyond the lot of mortals, which would basically plunge Narnia into civil war. <laughs> she gets things wrong, but she's got so much integrity and she's she's this shiningly good character. And you could tell that Lewis loves her very much. You could tell that as a child. I couldn't have expressed it, but I could see it. Um, Jill is very um, practical. She's She stands up for herself. She's she's great. Aravis rides a horse and carries a sword and dresses in armour and puts Shasta in his place when he says, only a girl. And she says, you're only a boy, a common little boy who's stolen his master's horse, a slave probably. And of course, that's so cutting because it's so close to the truth. And the argument that um, all the, the bad people the witch, you know, the witches are, are, are female and therefore Lewis was terrified of, of grown women. Well, yeah, maybe, but I don't really know because they're all, if, if you're going to be evil, you might as well be glamorous and charismatic with it. And they are the green <laughs> lady and the white witch. And of course, Queen Jadis, Aka, the white witch are pretty stunning figures. But it's not as though there aren't evil male characters who may be even worse. There's King Miraz, for example. There's, um, of course, the ape, uh, Shift, the ape. How horrible is he? There's Uncle Andrew, who's extraordinarily creepy in the uh, in the early stages of the book. Um, and they're, they're that, you know, you can't say, oh, Lewis put those in because he was afraid of grown men or, or, or chimpanzees. So I, I just don't think that argument stands. I think the, the books are not are not particularly sexist. He throws in the occasional silly comment about girls, little girls with fat legs, but then he talks about little boys with faces like pigs, so it sort of evens up. It's so, equal opportunity think, insults yeah. when they happen. Yeah, equal opportunity insults, I think. Christian propaganda. Well, I mean, yes, of course there's Christian symbolism in the books. They're not really allegories. People say they're allegories, but they're not. Lewis knew very well what an allegory was and what it isn't, and they're not allegories. To be honest, I don't think children notice that unless adults tell them about it. Mm. I, I didn't spot it until I read The Last Battle. Um, I remember when my mother was reading me The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, and when Aslan says, uh, you have known me a little here, so you'll know me better there, but there you'll know me by another name. And my, I remember my mother asking me, do you know what name that is? I was like, no. She said, it's Jesus. It's like, no, Jesus is a man. This guy's a lion. That makes, to, 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 to my little yeah. mind, that made no sense whatsoever. My mother was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and I think that's what most children think. Again, I put this in the book, but I did say to my mother once, I, it almost feels as if Narnia is real. 
And she just said, I think you're meant to feel that way. And she didn't explain. And I was very, very grateful. I still remain very grateful to her. My mum was a, a tactful lady in that respect. And when we got to the end of the last battle and I discovered that, you know, he no longer looks like a lion. What? What? <laughs> you know, where's Aslan? I want Aslan. I want his gorgeous silky mane and his golden fur. And anyway, so not, not, not happy. Not a happy bunny at that point, I have to say. Yeah, to be to be fair, the, the the last the last battle is usually quite a mixture of emotions for a child reading that the first time. Yeah, everything goes wrong. It's 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 not a comfortable book to read even now. Hmm. And it was the one I went back to the very least um, when I was rereading them. But uh, so I don't think the Christian propaganda should be a problem unless you've got adults in your life who want to hammer it home. In which case, you know, that's a done deal anyway. Racism, well, so I have the occasional upset person telling me that I can't say that Lewis is racist because everyone was racist back then and that's the way it was. Well, it's not quite true. Everybody wasn't racist back then. There was a writer called Geoffrey Trees who was doing his utmost to present. Um, he, was, he was a younger man than Lewis, but they were writing at the same time um, to present brown-skinned people and black-skinned people in sensitive and dignified ways and did a fairly good job actually um i think lewis had a blind spot there and i think largely it was because he did not like the arabian nights he didn't like those stories um coming back to the horse and his boy uh, as an adult what struck me forcibly was that in Calaman, you have an Arab you have effectively an Arabian Nights world. It, it sort of sounds and looks like Baghdad from from those stories. Mm -hmm. um, but there is no magic, no magic at all. There's no flying carpets or jinnies. There's no um, fairies, peris. There's there's zilch, no magic. And I wondered why. And then I thought because it's there to be the antithesis of everything that Narnia stands for. What Narnia actually stands for in this case is it's a child's paradise of talking animals and magic fairy, well, not magic so much, but fairy castles and children being able to be kings and queens. And no schools, of course. We have no schools in Narnia. And when they are introduced into Narnia in, the, you know, in, in Miraz's day, Aslan gets rid of them pretty quickly. Um, no transport, no infrastructure, no society of any sort um not even any villages there's a town at baruna but i don't know how long that lasts after aslan and the uh, the bacantes get there so um it works so long as you look at it through a child's eyes but there's one quote from the last battle which i think is just such nobody in this era could look at that and say this is not racist it's when um tyrion and jewel have just slain a couple of Calamans who've been using the talking horses to haul logs and they've been chopping down trees in lantern waste. And um, and then Tyrion has second thoughts and realises that he killed these people without offer, without assuming a challenge and his knightly honour is, you know, has been smirched and he's got to, he's got to give himself up. It's a, a very silly thing to do as King of Narnia, but it's the honourable thing to do. And, uh, and so he and Jewel give themselves up to the Calaman. And the next thing is we've got some sentence in which um, it says uh, that they're surrounded by brown men, their eyes flashing dreadfully in their brown faces and smelling of garlic and onions. And you just think to yourself, no, no, Lewis, how could you do that? You know, it's such um, such a dog whistle thing. So um, I don't know what he was doing, really. He, he obviously tried to make, I think he must have had some awareness of it because it's clearly not an Islamic society, mm -hmm. um, although it's based on Islamic um fairy tales, I suppose, because he gives them several gods. You know, you've got Tash Azeroth, I think, and Zardina, Lady of the Night. Mm -hmm. And we never hear any more about those two after uh, Aravis says that she, she, she lies to her father and says that she's going to go and pray to Zardina, Lady of the Night, in order to make her escape um, from the unwanted marriage to um, the vizier. It's focused on Tash. And of course, Tash is an altogether evil, monstrous demon. Whilst in some respects he's a, he's a marvellous invention, I think it would have been left better if nobody had worshipped him. I don't think, 
I don't know of any any great world religion which ever worships a being like that. So it's all a bit dodgy. Well, we're going to be looking at uh, a little bit more of specifically the, the the racism charge in a in a in a later episode. Uh, I was actually reading the the Horsens Boy at the moment because. The guys over at the Lamppost Listener are going through that chapter by chapter. Uh, and uh, I did chuckle because they released an episode today that I listened to this morning where they spoke about uh, Shasta going to going into the villages uh, to to buy, I think it was garlic. And uh, I, and I, I thought of that passage in your book. <laughs> it's like, ah, oh, Shasta smells of garlic too. <laughs> <laughs> was it garlic or was it onions? Oh, I, I was think, it onions? No, I think you're right. Yes, you are right. It was onions. You can just about eat an onion. I think tucking into a raw clove of garlic might be a bit beyond even Shasta. But oh, you haven't met my wife. He did try to meet cross, so there you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, boy. as we wrap things up, have you revisited or thought about revisiting any other books from your childhood? You said that you've still got them all. Uh, are you perhaps tempted to write uh, a similar kind of journey through one of those as well? I don't know. Um, I mean, you never know. Um, but to be honest, I don't think there is any other. There is no other series of books that touched me so deeply when I was a child. There just there couldn't be. I, I long to be in Narnia so, so strongly I could hardly bear it. Um, and so it's in a way it's this conversation between myself and that absolutely obsessed child, which was the sort of driving force for this book, I think. Uh, it, it wasn't just about me coming up with sort of clever, um, oh, look, I'm a grown-up and I've read this piece of literature and I can see where Lewis borrowed it from. Actually, my nine-year-old self wouldn't have been the least interested in any of that. Um, <laughs> and I think she was right. You know, I think it's interesting to know these things, but I think if you really want to read the books, you have to be like a little child again. Mm. I think that's definitely very true. Catherine, thanks so much for coming on the show. Where can listeners uh, go to find out more about you, uh, read your blog, and buy a copy of your book? Well, I'm on Twitter as Kath Langrish. That's K-A-T-H and then L-A-N-G-R-I-S-H. Uh, my website um, you'll find if you just look my name up. Um, and I blog at Seven Miles of Steel Thistles, which is quite an easy, well, hopefully it's quite an easy name to remember. It's actually borrowed from an Irish fairy tale in which the prince has to ride his magical pony over seven miles of hill on fire and seven miles of steel thistles and seven miles of sea, which I think is a rather good metaphor for the struggles of life and probably the year we've just been through. <laughs> um, you can buy the books. Um, people listening in the United States, um, I don't have a US publisher yet, although I'm working on it. Anybody publishes listening, please get in touch. But it's available on Amazon. It's also available from the Book Depository with free worldwide delivery. And uh, in the UK, it's also available in those places and in all good bookshops. And I'll make sure that there are links to all of those things in the show notes. Thanks again to Catherine for joining me today. Thanks to all of our patron supporters, particularly our top tier supporters. Shane, John, Kevin, Brian, Kay, Monique, Paul, Kimberly, Gillis, Gary, Jake, Stephen, Matt, Jeff, Kelly, Chris, John, James, Kate, and Rowdy. In one breath, wow. I'm getting better at this. <laughs> so thank you to all of those people who support us and help us do this. And as always, uh, we can be found on our website, pintsforjack.com, as well as on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and of course, MySpace. We're bringing it back. And please join us on our next episode when we will continue Narnia Month and we'll continue going further up and further in. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.